Hold control. This is where we really want to get focused on. Like, how do we control? How do we, how do we, uh, you know, reduce it? Moisture control, obviously, right? Reduce the, the level of uh, humidity in the air, and uh, you know, eliminate to repair any sources of excess moisture. Having good airflow, good circulation, is a, is a, is vital. Having proper ventilation and just being generally clean are good ways to control mold in general. Um, this device that's in front of you is a HIPAA HEPA filter, and uh, it is an amazing, amazing tool in uh, ensuring clean air is in your room. And uh, again, like I said, Michael and Andre will demonstrate this device later on, but this is one of the tools that would be essential to have to ensure that good ventilation and, uh, and good air circulation. Now we're going to get into some uh, funky little biology. There are four different categories of mold, and it's all depending on their different uh, kind of, you know, the water requirements for each to grow in. So one of them, the most common, is uh, hydrophilic mold, and this is what requires a lot of water. Typically, it happens after there's been, uh, you know, either a major flood or you know leaks in you know bathroom uh, and you know toilets and all that kind of stuff. That's pretty much where you'll find the majority of the mold is in, you know, the hydrophilic molds. Uh, this is where you'll find the, mo the most well-known species, which is the uh, Stachybotrys, which, which is this guy over here. This is black mold. Actually, this is the uh, the black mold spore, which uh, again, like I was saying, this is pretty much what it looks like with the root coming up and then the little tips at the at the very top. So, although this guy looks really cute, you guys know that black mold is not so cute. <laughs> and uh, I think we got some more over here. All right, who wants some black mold? You do. I can feel. It. All right. Right? And then there's a couple other uh, species in the hydrophilic uh, category. Uh, the next category is mesophilic, which it requires a little bit less moisture and grows in uh, like average water conditions. So this is where you would find it in, you know, perhaps like a kitchen or something along those lines. The humidity, the relative humidity, between 30 and 50 percent. The other one, the other three are, are pretty rare, especially in Ottawa. Uh, one of them is uh, zero tolerant, which they grow in drier conditions with very little humidity or moisture. And the other one, the zero felic one, something we won't see because it typically grows in dry environments like the desert. It's very rare, needs a little bit of moisture, but still exists. So if you guys were to retain one type of mold in particular, this is the one that we wouldn't, but that you guys would encounter the most in your day to day activities hydrophilic types of mold. Again, we're going to repeat the same things over and over again. Sorry. These guys are other types of mold. What are they called again, Andre? These are Asperger's molds. And uh, these guys, if you can tell, like, um, what I like about these in particular is that it shows the different types and the, the complexities of mold spores. Where if you look at, where's our, our fellow black molds? They're roaming around back there, right? See how fairly straightforward they are? It's got one stem. Thank you very much. It's got you know one stem. It's got about you know six little little nubs at the top. Pretty straightforward stuff. Once it starts getting to other things, they have multiple stems. They grow up, and then each of these carry hundreds and hundreds of millions of mold spores that just kind of pollinate the area. So it's like when you, when you start looking at terms like this, next time you look at mold, you're going to see that there's way more to it than meets the eye. I know I did when I started uh, playing around with these things. Here. Now, a small percentage of mold is, uh, is toxigenic. But this small percentage is the one that we should be concerned about. This is a type of mold that causes people to die. This is the type of mold that causes people to have major, major health problems and, uh, and really kind of to damage the overall continuity of a person or a family's life. Which is why having proper air quality testing is so, so vitally important. There are three primary ways that people can get infected or kind of can get uh, contaminated with mold. One of them is, is inhalation. Uh, you know, we, we inhale mold spores all the time. 
you know, we do. <laughs> Except we have, a, you know, we have an immune system that's that's you know designed to counteract and fight that. But uh, we inhale them all the time. And so if you're in an area that's highly concentrated with mold, is that you know you're going to run into people who are again sensitive, allergic, weak immune systems, and that's a, one of the primary ways that people get infected with uh, with mold-related illnesses is through inhalation. The other one is skin contact. Right? And that's why I was telling you guys, go on Google Images, research us, you know, skin mold contact images, you'll find some really nasty stuff. And uh, that's again, mainly people who, again, are either allergic or have low immune systems, uh, will react to uh, skin contact from mold spores. It's not so much the mold itself that they're coming in contact, keep that in mind. It's the spores that are in the air. And that's something that, that's very important. Uh, to know that it's not only direct contact with what you see on the material, but it's also what's floating around airborne in the air. The other one is ingestion. That's, uh, I mean, has anyone ever eaten moldy bread? Oh yeah. <laughs> Didn't expect anyone to put up their hands, but you know, that, that's another way, for example, of, uh, of ingesting mold is, you know, accidental or with children, for example. Uh, you know, Blue cheese. Blue cheese. Blue cheese. Yeah, exactly. Right? But if, if you are in a, in a home and a, a, you have a two year old who's running around and putting everything in his mouth and uh, comes across a, an area that's contaminated with mold, puts up a moldy piece of wood, puts it in his mouth, you are in the, you know, the, uh, you know, a major, major problem. There. So, today we learned not to put mold in one's mouth. I mean, you're risking the risk of infection. Uh, so other common symptoms, uh, and they, they vary from mild to severe, uh, some of the, the reactions that you get from mold, rash, itchy, congested, your nose seems plugged up, uh, once, once it starts getting a little bit more severe to moderate, itchiness, difficulty breathing, because uh, remember that the, the mold spores, um, they reproduce pretty much upon contact. Whenever there's water, the, the spores themselves start to duplicate. Now, how much is the, the human body made up of water? About 70% or so, right? 70 to 80 percent, we'll just we'll go with 80, the 20, 80 rule, right? 80% of the human body is made up of water. So what do you think happens when mold spores comes into contact with our body? They, want it, they, they automatically want to, I'm not saying they do, but they automatically want to reproduce. They're designed to reproduce right away. So once uh, you, know, you get into your system, into your lungs, and it's at a moderate level of infection, that's where you start with difficulty in breathing. It attacks your lung system, which is filled with fluid. Severe, so swelling, difficulty breathing, uh, abdominal pain, cramps, vomiting, mental confusion. Who here has experienced mental confusion in the last uh, 24 hours? <laughs> all right, so you know, we may all have been infected with all of us. All right, so some, uh, some common symptoms of pathogenic reactions. Superficial, uh, pretty much skin infection, nail infections, athlete's foot uh, are common uh, superficial levels of pathogenic reactions. Um, other ones in include one uh, sub sub subcutaneous, which is pretty much when it starts to get under the skin. And how that can happen is if you have a cut from, uh, you know, you're working on something, you scrape yourself with a nail, some spores get in there, it has a, the possibility of infecting itself underneath your skin. And systemic occurs when the infection is so deep into your system where it starts uh, attacking internal organs, such as your liver, your lungs, and, uh, and this is where it can become life threatening. Now, all of this seems really kind of scary at first. Like, we're just like hammering away at this dangerous stuff called mold and that can kill people and infect people and it's airborne and it reproduces. And all this stuff is really true, which is why the importance of, again, Testing what you come into contact with, right? What what may uh, typically be seen or regarded as mold may be something entirely different. Maybe discolored, discolored building material, or it could be a uh, very dangerous, crazy-looking black mold. And, and you know, you don't want to. You personally don't want to take any any chances with that. We all, everyone has uh, lives, families, people that depend on them, people that are accountable to them. And, uh, and so on with the people who live in the homes. So, you know, again, the important thing is to test every um, sign of mold to determine exactly what it is. Fortunately, Mold Busters is around to do exactly that. They have the most sophisticated 
and up-to-date tools at their disposal uh, with the impeccable track record up to date. We're just going to skip through this because um, we've already kind of uh, gone through this. So the the blue mold that you guys pass around is aspergillus, which is common. It's common in indoor and outdoor environments, and uh, it, it creates a, a lot of interesting health problems. It creates uh, um, primarily organ and, and system failure. And uh, the color of this type of mold varies from place to place. So what we typically see as black mold is this guy. And then what we see as other colored mold, like greenish, yellow, bluish types of mold, this is pretty much where we could classify uh, aspergillus. And you'll find this a lot outdoors, uh, in, you know, even in household plants in the soil. That's pretty much where you'll find this type of mold as well. This is a very common one. This uh, uh, penicillin is Penicillium, sorry, is often found in basements or attics and crawl spaces. It grows rapidly. It's, it's very identical to, uh, to aspergillus. Actually, in fact, if you were to kind of take them side by side under a microscope, you, you would have a hard time determining which one was which, right? Because they're very close uh, in, in color. And uh, they are initially white in color and then turn into that bluish green and pink over time. So again, there's a lot of different types of molds, a lot of different variations of them, and uh, conditions will change mold as well, right? Like we already established, uh, like different levels of humidity, different levels of temperature, so on and so forth. The length of time that mold has, has taken to grow and spend in a particular environment will all determine the, the changes in its uh, constructs. Black mold is uh, the most common one. This is the one that we would encounter uh, more and more on a daily basis. It's uh, commonly found in plant debris, soil, as well as uh, high moisture materials. It's black and green in color, kind of slimy and shiny, really disgusting looking stuff. Not as cute as these little guys. When it dries up, it becomes gray and powdery, and that stuff, again, floats through the air like crazy. So people who are at risk, people again with compromised or, or weak and low immune systems, infants, the uh, elderly people who are asthmatic, are people who are uh, you know, more prone to infection from mold. There is a relationship, uh, Health Canada issued this a while ago, uh, uh, there, uh, there's a relationship between indoor mold and increased symptoms such as eye, nose, and throat irritation, coughing, shortness of breath, asthma, and allergic reaction. Which is, uh, again, why uh, having machines like the HIPAA HEPA filter and having regular uh, inspections of, of uh, our indoor environments is good for businesses, organizations, and just our general homes because of these common problems that people encounter that are, that Health Canada are starting to see that correlation between mold and common uh, problems that we would just disregard. Now, you know, we have itchy noses, runny, you know, runny eyes, and and uh, you know we're coughing and all the rest of that kind of stuff, and we just dismiss it. We just think, okay, well, whatever, just a cold, no big deal. When really it could be a result of mold in, in the home. So, what is indoor air quality? Indoor air quality is the quality of air in and around buildings and structures. So, it's uh, frequently associated with the health and comfort of the building's occupants. Did you know that we spend about 90% of our time indoors? That's a lot. Uh, you know, when, I, when I read that statistic, I was not surprised at all. <laughs> so why is indoor air quality so important? Well, obviously we spend 90% of our time indoors, so we need to ensure that the quality of the air that we're breathing around us is good. Poor indoor air quality can worsen symptoms related to asthma and allergies. It's also been linked to something called uh, sick building syndrome. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's something that's been kind of uh, coming up a lot more frequently in businesses and organizations, is basically because the environments in which the people live in are contaminated with poor in their air, indoor air quality. And so uh, it causes, again, health problems, concerns, and so on and so forth. 